This is Book Notes, C-SPAN 60-minute discussion with the authors of public policy, historical, and political works. For the next hour, you'll see behind the titles and gain insight into the authors as people and the experiences which shape their lives. This week, our guest is Christopher Hitchens, columnist for Vanity Fair and The Nation. He joins us to discuss his recent book, For the Sake of Argument. Christopher Hitchens, author of all the little articles in the new book called For the Sake of, a, uh, of Argument. You've got a section in there called Rogue's Gallery. Was that your idea? Yes. Who are the, who are the, why, why, why create a rogue's gallery? For a lot of people, their, their first love is what they'll always remember. For me, it's always been the first hate. And I think that hatred, though it provides often rather junky energy, is a terrific way of getting you out of bed in the morning, keeping you going. It can be, if you don't let it get out of hand, it can be canalized into writing. And um, in this country where people like to be non-judgmental when they can be, which translates as on the whole lenient, there are an awful lot of bubble reputations floating around that, you know, one wouldn't be doing one's job if one didn't itch to prick. So, let me mention one right away, because yes. a couple of months ago, back during the Bush administration, in some article I remember popping up a paragraph that said, Dan Quayle's favorite book that he's reading is, I think it was called The Modern Society by Paul Johnson. Modern Times by Paul Johnson. Modern yes. Times by Paul Johnson. You, you have Paul Johnson in your rogues gallery. Who yeah. is he? Let me just say about that very point. Uh, Modern Times and, and Paul Johnson, the terrible reactionary British historian, pseudo-historian, I'd say, he used to be the Christmas gift of Rich Nixon. Um, he, in the Quayle and Bush era, became a cult figure on the right. And there's a wonderful description in Peggy Noonan's book of walking past Quayle's office and seeing Modern Times portentously open at a certain page. You know, Quayle's reading this book and walking past it several weeks later and seeing that it was still open at the same page. Um, he's a cult on the American right. Um, he used to be my editor um, at a British leftist liberal magazine called The New Statesman, once a very famous weekly review where we both worked. And he's probably the classic instance of the guy who, um, having lost his faith, believes that he's found his reason. In other words, a, a defector. And he's become uh, a very farouche Thatcherite figure. And he wrote a terrible book called Intellectuals, which I decided I would unload upon. And at some point in this piece uh, that you have, and this is a book of all kinds of pieces that you've written for a lot of different publications, I don't know where it is, you say, sorry about that, Paul, I think. Uh, is, was it, is it hard to punch at somebody you know or you used it to work It can for? be harder, yes. And uh, George Orwell used to say, I won't have lunch with X or Y because I'm, I'm going to write about him soon and I'm sure I'm going to find he's really quite nice. And therefore I don't want the corrupting effect of a, a sort of acquaintanceship or friendship I'd rather keep clean and keep pure. I.F. Stone in Washington used to do the same thing. He wouldn't go to briefings and little soirees because he, he wanted to be able to say what he thought about people. I actually, do, I'm not that fortunate. I'm compulsively social. But with, with um, Johnson, I had to say, look, um, in your book, Intellectuals, you have said that certain people, mainly liberal and radical intellectuals, can be defamed, grossly defamed, actually, in his book, on the grounds that their private life wasn't exemplary. Well, Paul, use of the first name, I know you, and I think it's unwise of you to make the private life the, uh, the measure of anything. Yeah, like, um, for instance, you say that... Um this often involved drunken and boorish conduct towards women, including his wife. This is up for, front of this yes. piece. Yeah, no, I, I had to say, I had to say, look, I don't think this kind of stuff counts. I, if I was writing about Voltaire, would not go and look in his linen basket uh, in order to, to attack his ideas. But if you're going to do it, then you become a hostage to it yourself. And so the first part of the piece is supposed really to be a lampoon. I say, if I was doing Johnson, as a political figure, and if I was Johnson doing it, I'd do it like this, just to show him how it feels. Then I, I hope successfully, in, I make a transition in the rest of the article and say, actually, that's all for show, that's not the point. The problem with Johnson's theory about, about Noam Chomsky, who attacks revoltingly, about Voltaire, about Marx, uh, about other great figures of the, the modern world, um, could, can and should be attacked in other ways. And, I don't know what the American equivalent of this of this is exactly, um, but in, in England there's a motto, a sort of schoolboy type morality motto, which says that you, 
you tackle the, the ball and not the man. This book has a picture, black and white picture on the cover of you, um, sitting there with a cigarette in your hand. And uh, is it, I can't see where I am, is that alcohol there in front of you? There are about nine or ten empty glasses in front of me. Only two or three of them are mine, I hope it's clear. And, and I think only probably about two of them are filled or have just been emptied of booze. It's me slumped over a dinner table the night I got married, as a matter of fact, and Annie Leibovitz was there and took a picture of me, which I thought did actually look, for better or worse, pretty much like I do. Let's take a look at it again. Um, this your idea to put this on the cover? Well, partly it, it was because not everyone has the chance to have their picture taken by Annie Leibovitz, and second, because she is a genius photographer and she does capture what I'm like after about eight o'clock in the evening. And third is that one of the longer articles in the book is a defense of smoking and drinking and of alcohol and nicotine um, against the current sort of prohibitionist mentality that's sweeping the country. It's a, it's a sort of in-your-face reply to the new Puritanism. L that expression on your face. And I'm sitting here now, for example, thinking how much I like these sorts of discussion and thinking, but if I just had a brandy and soda there and an ashtray, how much better a side of me you'd be seeing? You think that's you? Yeah, I'm afraid so. I have to face it. Like everyone else. I, I keep mentioning Orwell, but he says that the I think he says at the age of 40, a man has the face he deserves. I won't see 40 again, so I, I guess I'm stuck with that now. The purpose of a book like this? Well, um, I wrote it as a, as a reply. I mean, the pieces are very various. That's what I think anyway. They're a salad. Uh, but they have a common theme, which is it's a reply to all those who say that um, since the 1989 revolution, that there's really no need for the left critique of society or politics anymore, that we've moved beyond all that, that society is just, is just basically a liberal problem-solving matter and no more. Um, though the conservatives, I notice, are still allowed to have their say. Implicitly, everything in there is about the origins of the 1989 revolution in Eastern Europe, which I covered in some part, um, and its consequences. Um, and I define it as a real emancipating revolution that I'd long hoped for and worked for and supported but one that by no means makes politics any more one-dimensional. I mean, I think actually it restores the left as a very necessary part of the political argument. So even when I'm writing about something else, I'm, I'm always trying to bear that in mind. And the articles come from places like a magazine called The Nation. Sure. If someone's never read The Nation, what is it? The Nation is America's oldest political weekly magazine. It was founded in 1865 uh, towards the end of the Civil War by a group of abolitionists, and it's it's basically upheld the, the liberal left end of the spectrum, held up that end of the rope um, ever since. Um, and still proudly comes out every week, and every other week it features, and has for the last ten years, a column by me called Minority Report, which sometimes about politics, sometimes about a new book, sometimes about a personality, but is, again, an attempt to, to mount a, a left critique of, of society and politics. There are other th publications like Times Literary Supplement, what Times? The London Times. Uh, the, the TLS, as it's called, the Science Literary Supplement, sells independently as a weekly, and actually half its uh, subscribers are in the United States. Um, and I used to be its American columnist. And in there I've written about more general subjects like the work of Graham Greene, or P.G. Woodhouse, who's perhaps my favorite author, um, and a couple of other more, more literary pieces. But again, in there, I try put it like this, I try when I'm writing about literature not to leave the political dimension out. And when I'm writing about politics, I try and, and recall that politics isn't all there is to life and, and try and import what you might call cultural or literary or aesthetic points to it. Isn't this PG must make me sound uh, insufferable, but I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that's my ambition anyway. Isn't P.G. Woodhouse's, uh, another person that writes about him all the time, George Will? Yes, I mean, it's, you get into terrifically bad company some of the time if you're a fan of Woodhouse. Uh, that's actually Who is true. He, by the way? That's true of also being a fan of Kipling or Orwell or many other people. P.G. Woodhouse is the author of the most imperishable, I think, um, double act in, in fictional history. That's uh, Bertie Wooster and his manservant Jeeves. And it's impossible. I mean, of course, a joke is never a joke if it has to be explained. But to those who haven't found and discovered and immerse themselves in this. I can only say they should start today. And the well, other when were your first it sounds a bit cultish, but those who have already done it will already know what I'm talking about. Who is he? 
Was. That's what he I mean, died right? at the age of um, about 93 in the mid-70s. He was um, an English comic writer who, as a matter of fact, got driven out of England, rather, um, partly by poverty, and moved to America, which he adored and stayed for the last 50 or so years of his life on Long Island. But he was always writing about the sort of mythical golden past of the English country house and of the English gentleman of leisure and man about town in London, Bertie Worcester, who's a complete chinless idiot and can't get himself out of any scrape of any, any sort without the help of his amazingly impassive, brilliant, classically educated, as he's called in the stories, personal gentleman's gentleman, the butler achieves. Um, who's always rescuing him. It's, it's not unlike um, the importance of being earnest. Uh, these are guys who would be nowhere without their servants and are always getting involved in ridiculous love affairs that have to be explained to them and they have to be hauled out of and stood up on their feet again. Another member of your Rose Gallery is Henry Kissinger? Of, of, com. of whose Rose Gallery is he not a member? No, well, Mark, Mark Twain said, uh, if you give a man a reputation as an early riser, um, he can sleep till noon. Kissinger has somewhere or another along the line picked up a, a reputation as a statesman and, and peacemaker, um, a negotiator and sort of miraculous deal and, and uh, deal maker and bridge builder. I invite people in this piece to consider any instance in which he's left a country or a cause or a problem better off than when he found it. And I also point to what I consider to be a record of crime, um, his past. I mean, he's, he's been complicit in the commissioning of assassinations and, and in the covering up of mass murder. Um, and I think, actually, there are, there are some signs in his own memoirs and his behavior that he enjoys it, um, that he's a very dangerous person, a war criminal. And you say you're a social and person. And I give the, I give the list of um, instances where I believe that to be true, and I give them here and now, if you like. Before you do that, uh, you say you're a social person. Uh, he is known to be social from time to time. Have you ever come across his Well, path? as a matter of fact, I have twice been um, on the verge of being introduced to him and, and broken my usual rule, which is, I think, for a journalist, a necessary one. You know, there's no hand one shouldn't shake. One's job is to see everyone and talk to everyone and do everything. But I can't do it with him. I've just had to turn away. And once was rude before doing so to him. Uh, in other words, I feel that everyone must have some kind of moral last ditch, and this is mine. I couldn't. I couldn't be polite to him, and so it would be hypocritical um, to be, as it were, presented. Not that he cares or even notices, I'm sure. Does, you, you don't think he notices? Well, it's difficult to say. He's often shown he's got a very thin skin. I mean, when the Cy Hirsch book came out, he went into a ter terrific tantrum, if you remember. And he also went into a great tantrum about Walter Isaacson's book, of which this is a review. Um, he's not at all... He likes to think he's tolerant, generous, broad-minded, and when he's on Nightline with no opposition, he likes to crack the odd, rather sinister joke, but I don't think, in fact, he does have any talent for introspection or, or, or humor or um, self-doubt or self-criticism, whatever. We can come back to more on Henry Kissinger, possibly there's so much to talk about, I want to move on to yeah. Mother Teresa. Aha, uh -huh, yes. You have a piece in here that uh, was in The Nation in April of 1992, and you call this the ghoul of Calcutta? Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa? Mother Teresa, the ghoul, the ghoul of Calcutta. Of Calcutta. Yeah. I, I always had a real doubt in my mind as to whether there really was this saintly person. And if you ask people, why do they think Mother Teresa is so great? They'll always say, well, isn't it true that she spends her time always, you know, helping out the poor of Calcutta? But if they really push them, they don't know anything about her at all. They just take it on faith, as saints always are taken. So I went to Calcutta, actually for another reason. I thought, well, I'm there, I'll go and look her up. And I was rather appalled by what I found. I mean, she was, she showed me around her mission, and she announced that the purpose of the mission was to run a, a campaign in Calcutta, in Bengal, against abortion and contraception. Now, as it happens, I'm, I'm, I have my doubts about abortion. Uh, I find I'm very squeamish on the subject, but one thing that Calcutta definitely does not need is a campaign waged by an Albanian Catholic missionary against the limitation of the population. And it, it, it rather, to me, spoiled the effect of her charitable work, that she was saying, actually, this is not charity, it's... it's religious propaganda. Um, and I think the Vatican policy on population control is calamitous. Um, so that aroused my curiosity anyway. It had been a bit of a disappointment meeting her there. And I didn't like her manners actually particularly either as she went around, around, around among excuse me, the poor. Then I found her turning up as the defender of the Duvalier family in Haiti. 
um, saying how lovely they were and how gentle and beautiful. Then I found her turning up as Charles Keating's personal best friend in the Lincoln Savings and Loan scandal, taking a lot of money from him for a private plane, giving him blessings and crucifixes in return. Then I found her turning up in Albania, where she's a supporter of a very extreme right uh, nationalist party. And quite a few other such things. And I thought, A, I don't like any of these things, singly or together. And second, when does she ever get time for the poor old poor of Calcutta? She's forever on some scumbag's Learjet going around cashing in on the belie everyone else's belief that she's a saint. And, and I think this is probably how medieval religion was worked. But, but as, same, as a con, people just, you know, you, you took the faithful as credulous and you reckoned that they would believe whatever you said. Let me just take her side for purpose of discussion. Well, Let's say that she went to the Devalier family and got money, went to Charles Keating and got money, and moved it over to the poor. Wouldn't that be charity? And I, I don't think it's necessary for someone who's, who is supposedly consecrated to the mission of charity and who's world famous for it to ever have to beg for money. If she ever wanted it, she knows where to go for it. People would open their pockets and their, I think, their hearts. No, the fact is, um, I don't even know if she got any money from the Duvaliers. What she was doing was defending them as a dynasty in Haiti. And everyone knows what the record of the Duvalier family is in Haiti. She did get money from Keating, and I actually asked in my piece, you know, would she care, would anyone care to say what, that they know where it's gone? Because she must have known or should have known that that money doesn't belong to Keating and doesn't belong to her. It's stolen money. But okay, let her say. But the fact is, um, she was giving him in return various kinds of absolution in his campaigns. And I think this is because you know, he started off life as a morals cop. He was another of the prohibitionists. He began his career as an anti-pornography anti poser. She's, she's evidently, it seems to me, on, on call for people, dubious characters of this kind. I just thought it was worth pointing out. I, I can't tell you the mail I got about it. I mean, if you, if you touch the idea of sainthood, especially in this country. People feel you've taken something from them personally. Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated because, of course, we like to look down on other religious beliefs as being tribal and superstitious. So over the, never dare criticize our own. Over the years, what has brought you the most mail? That was one. Um, gosh, my mind suddenly goes blank when I think, well, the other mailbags. Well, actually, a piece I once wrote about, um, about Henry Kissinger was another one. Um, yeah, that was in the London writing, Review. They agree or disagree with you? People writing that, uh, well, I shouldn't be the one to say, but actually people were writing and saying, I've long wanted someone to write about him in that way, not to write about him as if he was a great statesman, but as if he was a great criminal. There's another piece here, it was in the Condé Nast Traveler in uh, 1990, mm. and it's about P.J. O'Rourke, and it says, oh, not yes. funny enough, what are you doing writing for the Condé Nast Traveler? Listen, I'm, I'm not in a position to turn anyone down. I'm very proud to, if anyone ever asks me. Um, I, in fact, I, I work part of the time for Condé Nast, more or less all the time, actually. I write a column for Vanity Fair called, called Cultural Elite, which appears every month now. By the way, what's, who's Condé Nast? Oh, Condé Nast is the... Well, Condé Nast was a, uh, an individual, a great publisher and, and designer. And he started the family of magazines that we associate with Vogue, Vanity Fair, which is its flagship, a travel magazine called Condé Nast Traveler, um, The New Yorker, um, in other words, you know, the core of American magazine life, now owned by the Newhouse family. P.J. O'Rourke is in, uh, in your Rose Gallery. Who yeah. is he? P.J. O'Rourke is a guy who gets away, in my opinion, with murder. I mean, he's, um, he's another ex-leftist, um, 60s radical dropout, wrote very funnily about what it was like being permanently stoned and bummed out and paranoid in the 60s. Then saw the light, put on a collar and tie, became a young Republican, and has been cashing in this chip ever since and has a terrific sort of following as a humorist um, for his books of essays. One, the first one, quite funny, is called Republican Party Reptile. And the next one was called, is called Holidays in Hell. And more recent one is called uh, Give War a Chance. And these sell terribly well among the young, much better than any of my books ever have. And it gets me down. So this is my revenge upon him. Do you know him? That. Yeah, I've met him, sure. And he has quite a good guy to hang out with in, in a bar and so forth. But, I, I've reckoned that he was running on empty with this joke about, I know, I know I've been there, I've been a radical, now I see how wonderful it would be to be a completely buttoned up, buttoned down Tory. And the joke basically depends on, on a satire on political correctness. You know. Okay, so people try not to make jokes about AIDS, PJ will make a joke about AIDS. Okay, it's not funny to laugh at cripples, well I'll laugh about cripples. And I said, look, in the words of the title of the review. That's not, that's quite funny, but it's not funny enough. 
It's a gentle rebuke. Where were you born? Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Hampshire, England. Now I'm a Navy brat. In other words, well, what did your dad do? It's a lifetime um, naval officer in, in the, the service of the king and and indeed of the empire. And oh. until I was, I don't know, about twelve, I wanted to do the same. Are, are, is your dad still alive? No, alas. Your mother? No. Nope. How many kids in the family? Just me and my brother. My brother's a very conservative journalist, um, writes for a conservative tabloid in England called the Daily Express. He's just, in fact, become its Washington correspondent. Um, he's having been in Moscow for it for a long time. He's a very brilliant guy, um, very, very thoughtful, very good writer, with political views polar opposite of mine. He's just, he just arrived in Washington this week, so I'm looking forward to... I think I'll probably have to give you know, a party or something and say, okay, here's the Hitchens family secret, now you know everything. What's his first name? Peter. And is it Daily Express, the paper that, uh, that Lord Beaverbrook That's right, it was Beaverbrook's flagship. I used to work for it myself, but I, I, had, to, I had to quit. It was too much for me. You grew up in Portsmouth, which in Great Britain is located where in the country? It's on the south coast, and it's, if you could think of the south coast as a, a sort of line at an angle to Europe, and there's a small island called the Isle of Wight which forms a perfect, by protecting a certain area of the coast, it forms a perfect natural harbour, and Portsmouth is where Lord Nelson last set foot on land before, before joining his ship and going off to Trafalgar, for example. It, it's always been the, the home port of the, of the British Navy. It's where the great ships were built. Um, it still is very much in that maritime tradition, and there's a graveyard full of Hitchenses on Ports Downhill that overlooks it. What year were you born? 1949. How long did you live there? In Portsmouth, not frightfully long at first, because my father was being moved around a lot. The, there was still quite a big British naval and military presence in the world then. And the first place I can remember is the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, which was then a semi-colony of the United Kingdom. It's where my brother was born. And so my first memory is of the Grand Harbour at Valletta, which is, by the way, a magnificent thing to have as your first memory. It's why I've always loved, I think, the Mediterranean. And then we were sent to a Navy base in Scotland. We moved around like that. We came back to Portsmouth for a bit. The place I spent longest in is Oxford and then London. And your father politically was what? Very conservative. Your mother? Um, uh, rather more of the, the compassionate liberal type, my mother. How'd that work? Well, actually, I must say for them, I mean, neither of them attempted to impose their political opinions on me. And until I developed my own views, I didn't really know what theirs were. I mean, then I found out that my father actually was, he really believed it all about basically the Conservative Party, the, the monarchy. Not so much the Church of England, I don't think, but the, it, you could say what it stood for. And I felt sad and bad about the decline of England as a country and, and, as, a, and as a society. Sorry, hard to say. And as a society. You, you went to... Oxford. Sort of pessimistic, and, um, pessimistic and, and a bit resentful at the way things had turned out in his old age. Yes, I went to Oxford University. How did you get in? Well, I was the first member of my family to go to a university. Um, or uh, certainly to go to Oxford, and um, and I, I worked. We had to, as a family to sort of work out the steps. If you want to be upwardly mobile in Britain, that's the key thing. So the step one is you have to go to a private school, basically, if you're starting from where we were. So my parents made a big sacrifice to send me to a private school. Where in Cambridge, actually, a Methodist public school in Cambridge called the Lees. Good, pretty good school. And there, I decided that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a writer. Um, Were you making good grades throughout all this period? Good enough, yeah. And then they, you have to have certain grades to try for Oxford, and then you sit a separate exam and have an interview and so on. And I knew that I wanted to go to Balliol College in Oxford, and I wanted to read philosophy, politics, and economics, the PPE course, as it's called. And, well, I, wanted, I, and I wanted to be a writer or conceivably a politician. So I knew from very early on what I wanted to do. Who went to Balliol that you knew or that you in history? No one, no one. Well, that I knew about in history. Well, most of the last five or six prime ministers had been there and a lot of the radical journalists and historians and, and authors had been there. It was a kind of forcing house for... I mean, it's resented in England, the fact that even the opposition types come, you know, the famous ones come from, have been to the same colleges as the ruling class, but in a small country and a very encrusted society like that, probably unavoidable. Who's your favorite radical journalist in history? In history? I suppose I'd have to say George Orwell. I, I know it's cliched because everyone now pretends to admire him, but there was a long time when he wasn't well known and certainly not well liked. And I think it shows in his prose, and it's those bits of his prose that I admire.
Did he go to Bayonne? No, he didn't go to university at all. Nor did my living favourite, uh, Gore Vidal, go to college either. And I've always thought that's a good counsel for people who think that credentials are everything. You don't have to do any of that. Orwell went to a privileged public school, but he then went off to be, again, because of the poverty of his family, went off to be a colonial policeman in Burma. What did you like about George Orwell? Well, um, again, not to sound too conventional about it, um, I think he really would follow a logic and honesty to their, to their full conclusion. I mean, he would not be deflected by the fact that this might offend someone he knew or some cause with which he was associated, or more important, I mean, wouldn't uh, even discompose himself. In other words, he thought, okay, if I don't like this conclusion, I'm still sticking with it if it's, if it's been arrived at honorably. It sounds like an easy thing to do or to say, but it's actually very hard to live by, and I think he really did live by it. I thought he, I thought he put up a good show for the left in his life at a time when it was in great difficulty because people were pressed very hard to say, look, if you're on the left, you must support the Soviet Union because it's endangered and it's encircled by fascism and so on, and you mustn't criticize it in public even if you have your doubts. And he said, no, that, that would be stupid. That would be giving up the thing that makes me a radical in the first place, which is the right to think for myself. That was a lot harder to do now than it sounds again. And then I think he was a very witty and brilliant um, stylist. I, I think his writings on other authors like Dickens, for example, um, his reflections on so eternal subjects like capital punishment, for example, or family life, ordinary things, every th arguments that never go away, always worth rereading. When did you come to the United States? 1980. Why? Well, I'd been coming ever since I left university. I came here on a scholarship in 1970. To where? For, to, it was a traveling scholarship. We got to travel all around the U.S. And I decided then and there that I'd, I'd rather live in America. I thought it was great. And um, I nearly didn't go back when the scholarship ran out, but I sort of had to because I was out of dough. And actually there was, well, there was, a, there was a woman in the case. I actually had to go back to England. So I didn't come back again for about another five or six years, but started coming more and more often, and then the nation offered me a, a job. So I, I took about ten seconds to decide, yeah, I'm, I'm coming for good. Where have you lived in the United States? New York at first, and then in Washington. I've been in Washington for nearly ten years now. I can hear folks saying he likes it here in the United States, and he's a socialist. Yeah, sure. I'm sure you've heard that before. Absolutely. If, if, if you want a socialism, why did you come to the United States? Well, I, I, I think it's a very good question. Um, and I ask it myself. I mean, there's a long tradition that's unfortunately been buried, forgotten, um, and it's exemplified by, I suppose, the greatest Englishman and the greatest American, certainly the greatest Anglo-American, Thomas Paine, who is, in effect, I mean, the moral author of the Declaration of Independence and of important bits of the Constitution and who wrote the crisis and wrote Common Sense and was one of the people who really nerved the colonial leadership to actually separate and declare for the United States, was the first person ever to use the term the United States of America, um, would have written slavery out of the Constitution, if he'd been allowed to, he wasn't allowed to, would have put the emancipation of women in, again, lost that battle, think how much trouble would have been saved if he'd won, and is the founding radical, really, of the British left, and though they don't know it, of American democracy, too. So I wouldn't dream of... Uh, comparing myself to him, obviously, but I mean to say he's the founder of a tradition that does exist in both countries, of which I'm proud to be a supporter at any rate, and which I try, in stuff I've written in my previous book, I wrote a long defense of Thomas Paine, try to uphold and live by. Um, I think America has a fantastic uh, radical tradition, a very admirable one. Um, it goes from Thomas Paine through, well, through the anti-slavery campaigners, particularly John Brown and, and um, William Lloyd Garrison, some of whom and their descendants were associated with the nation, incidentally, through Eugene Debs, through Martin Luther King, through Cesar Chavez. And th that's, my, that's my tradition, if I, if I can make such a bold claim. I hope not to disgrace it anyway, even if I don't um, enhance it. Uh, there was a show that we did a number of... I can't remember exactly when it was, when you had a young man standing by you and we opened the show up, Alexander, your son. Yes. Uh, is this, you're married? I'm not married to his mother anymore, but I'm married again, yes. And how many children do you have? Well, I have two, and I have one on the way by my new wife. So I'm about to become an exemplar of family values one way or another. 
Uh, let's go back to uh, Oxford. Yes. Because in the book, you have a number of articles about then-candidate Bill Clinton. Yes. You went to Oxford at the same time. Mm -hmm. Did you know him there? No, I didn't. I knew the house where he lived, 46 Lexford Road, quite well, because it was a well-known hangout for um, American exile, usually Rhodes Scholar, but not always, uh, anti-war and pro-civil rights people. And th those were my friends. And I knew people who knew Bill Clinton, and I still do know some of them. And I remember the milieu very well. And I remember we used to do all kinds of stuff to help out the American anti-war students who I think were being very brave at the time, much braver than they're given credit for. But I, I'm sure, I've looked at pictures of him at the time, I'm sure I don't remember him. Who did you and In know? fact, during the campaign I used to say to people, I can prove to you Bill Clinton is a moderate, as he claims, because if he was an extremist, I definitely would have known him. What were you like there? What was I like? Yes. I, well, I was, as I still am, an extreme leftist. Did you speak out? Yeah. I were mean, you, there's an you, occasion where, where we, we may even have been on the same platform, but uh, there's no picture of it that I can find, which was the, the, um, the moratorium against the war, which is, you remember, huge candlelit meetings in all the American cities against the war. Stop it now, shut it down, the moratorium. And in every European city, there was a sympathy demonstration. There was a quite a big one in Oxford where I spoke. And I, I know that Clinton was there, and he may even have spoken with me, but I can't, I can't get him, I can't get his, bring his picture back into my mind. Who did you know then that we would know now? There's a guy called Ira Magaziner, who is in, sort of in charge of what's laughingly called Hillary Clinton's health care task force, and who is, was always the sort of technical and organizing brain of the Americans in Oxford. And it's considered to be a very terrific number cruncher and, and uh, reasoner of that sort. I, I remember him very well. As he was at my college, um, George Stephanopoulos was there later. Balliol had a special attraction often to these kinds of Americans my own college did. But, but Bill, no. And I, I, as I say, I think that proves that he must have been, um, as he says he was, one of the more moderate anti-war people. Can you remember when you became a socialist? Pretty much, yeah. What year? Well, I remember when I decided that I supported the victory of the Labour Party, which, as you know, is a very different thing, but that was in 1964. And I had been reading, I'd been reading a lot of Orwell. I'd been reading the... Actually, the thing that had more influence on me almost than anything was the poetry of Wilfred Owen. Who is he? He was the great poet of the First World War. Um, he wrote a wonderful poem called Anthem for Doomed Youth, and another, which has a Latin title, Dulce et Decorum Est, you know, that's on all war memorials, sweet and seemly to die for the country fantastically powerful anti-war poetry written from the trenches and very tragically he was killed um, I think on the very last day of the First World War or the day before the very last moments of the, of the nightmare his mother got the telegram about his death as the bells the church bells were tolling for victory in 1918 and it, it had a tremendous effect on me reading that another book which some people may remember called How Green Was My Valley by the Welsh mining valleys, introduced me to the idea which had been strange to me up till then of there the being such a thing actually as a working class, um, with a, as it were, life and mind of its own. And you can't be a socialist if you don't think that. When did you start writing and enjoying it, or do you enjoy writing? I don't really know if I do or not. I mean, I, I hate not writing, I know that, and I, I sort of do it because I feel I have to. Sometimes it's real pleasure doing it. Usually the pleasure comes there when, when you see it in print. Not until then. Where do you and write? And usually not till some time after. Where that. do you write? Well, I write a column every month of Anti Fair called Cultural Elite. And where? Physically? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I write on a table at home in longhand. When we see this picture, though, do we? Is this the what, what you look like when you're writing? The yeah. Cigarette in hand and the. Yeah, I sometimes write in bars too in the afternoons. In I, bars? Yeah, I go out and find the corner of a bar. Quite like if the noise isn't directed at me. In other words, if it's not a phone ringing or a baby crying or something. I quite like it if the jukebox is on and people are shouting the odds about a sports game. I just hunched over a bottle in the corner and I write in longhand anyway so I can do it anywhere. Sometimes in airport terminals. And then when I've got enough down, I start to type it out, editing it as I go. I don't use any of the new technology stuff. Do, do you have a technique that gets people's attention? I mean, is there something... You... Oh, I should ask you. Well, there's a headline on it. Here's one. Let's try this one on. I don't even know where this one was published. I'll find out I here. I trust it to fall open at a good page. Newsday, July 1990. When, how often did you write for Newsday? Oh, I used to do a book uh, column for them every week. This is called A Pundit Who Need Never Dine Alone. That's George Will. George Will. Yes. 
And you start off here by saying, study and ponder the following lines written by George F. Will as Ronald Reagan went tottering back to his California estate in 1989. And then you go on to lambast him for writing what you said is basically cool unintelligible. Well, I thought I think it's I think George Will stuff is very affected and overwritten. Yes, it's full of, I think rather bogus shows of learning and classical tags and things of this kind. I have a weakness sometimes for quotations of that sort myself. So I think I recognise the disease in others, and it's in a very advanced stage in his case. But I think he's a courtier. I think especially during the Reagan era, he he basically was making a living as a as a professional flatterer of the Reagan Nancy, the Ron and Nancy court. And I think Which that's, I don't that? think journalists should do that. I think it's even more important not to do it when your friends are in power. Speaking of... of What's uh, wrong with it? Yeah. It? Well, I think for one thing, it'll congest your style very badly. You'll be full of things you can't really say, things that are half confidences that have been given to you by people in power. Your stuff will start to puff up. Your, your paragraphs will start to get rotund with all the things you could say if you really wanted, but you can only hint. That's bad. It's bad intellectually, and I think it's bad morally. It well, means well, that you become... Your contract is no longer with your readers. And my, what I try and do, and the reason I write in longhand and write in isolation, is to say the only, the only person I have a deal with is the person who might read this. And I'll give them my best. I don't care what the editor thinks, the advertising department thinks, um, friends and colleagues think. You try and live as it were as if none of those people counted. I think, what's the best account I can give the customers of this? Most of Washington punditry is nothing of the kind. It's it's private letters written to other pundits and appearing in public space. Have you done as well in this business as you expected to? Better than I expected to. Better than I expected to. Not as well as I um, would have um, once or twice been believed by my teachers who were always telling me, come on Hitchens, you, could, you, you should be sitting there mouldering, you should be Daniel Defoe or something. So they helped me to impossible standards. but. Better than, I, better than I expected, yeah. But Can you make a decent partly because living? The, the, partly because there isn't in, the, in this country decent living, yes. Yeah, America's very generous to people who, who, who write on the whole. If they keep at it, I mean, there are, there are rewards for it. There are people who are willing to print it and pay you. Do, 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 are there people who genuinely dislike you that you come in contact with? There ought to be by now. I mean, I've certainly done my best. If I, if the, if I didn't have enemies, probably people I don't know about as well as those I do, I would have obviously failed. I would have would have meant I hadn't been drawing blood when I had certainly meant to. How do you know when you, you've gotten to people? Well, sometimes they will come up to you and, and speak. You ever had a confrontation? Sure. There was some confrontation you had on a, on a television show one time. Where... What else with Ed Meese? But... Got yeah. a little physical? I thought it was going to get physical, as a matter of fact. Yes. I thought he was the most... I thought it was just a, such a disgrace that such a man could be an attorney general in a country that has a justice department. The, I had to tell him everything I thought about him, and, and he wasn't, which is not my fault, used to hearing that kind of thing. Look, um, I mean, this is a bit of a digression, but the scandal that he helped cover up, the, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal, was, was also covered up, of course, and lied about by both Ronald Reagan and George Bush. Reagan did say one truthful thing about it. He said, if it wasn't for that rag in Beirut, we'd never have had all this trouble. And I thought that was true. If it wasn't for a newspaper in Beirut, the Iran-Contra scandal never would have come to light. And yet, how many journalists would you say there are in Washington? Well-paid, well-informed, well-connected. Thousands of them. Who never broke the story. Who, a lot of them didn't believe it even when it came out. That's a pretty tremendous indictment. What do you think of... Um... And so I try, as far as I can, not to get too accustomed to, you know, the, the, the culture of journalism, because I think... It, it's, it's likely to be the outsiders that will do the best work. But you said you were social. I like to go to uh, gatherings and I like to meet the people firsthand. I always liked that. That's why I used to go to the Oxford Union when I was at the university and debate against actual politicians and try and have dinner with them afterwards because you very swiftly found out it was very good for your education. But they didn't really know very much more than you did and they weren't that much smarter. It was a good way of demystifying politics. Looking at something called How Neoconservatives Perish. Oh, yeah. Do you remember this one? Sure. By the way, did you select all these? Was this your choice? Well, I mean, I selected, I threw out the ones that I didn't think could possibly be reprinted because they either were no good 
which was true in an awful number of cases, or that they'd gone out of time. They were written just for that week or that day and wouldn't survive. And so of the ones that could bear reprinting, I made a pile. Then I gave that to an editor and said, you decide which ones you think would make the cut. So I left that to them. How many books do you have to sell them to be successful with this? I have no idea. I've never got... It's a figure larger than any book I've ever written has ever sold. But most of my books don't make back the money, the small sum of money that I'm paid to write them. I don't know why. I don't have any knack there at all. It's a wonder, in fact. I mean, there, there are very, very few publishers these days who will take a risk on a book that won't make money. Um, and I'm probably exhausting the patience of... Um, this is Verso Publishing? Yeah, well, that's the publishing arm of New Left Books. It's a very fine publishing firm, by the way. It's extremely... It's published some wonderful books, but it, it has to take permanent risks on opposition writing and, and unknown writers. I mean, they probably would never let me down, but increasingly the mainstream publishing industry, I think, wants an assurance up front that everything's commercial and that you've got a tie-in of some sort of serialization or maybe a movie deal, and I'm, I'm no, you know, good at that. I wish I was. In this piece in Harper's of in 1990, how neoconservatives perish, you talk about uh, key words and phrases uttered with the proper sneer, um, disinformation, dupe, mm -hmm. ripe fruit, mm -hmm. choke point, mm -hmm. fellow traveler, uh, fifth columnist, Chamberlain's umbrella, captive nation, peace through strength, moral equivalence. Yeah, don't you remember what, what you it was like? Don't you remember what a sort of hooligan atmosphere there was in American intellectual life for a long time because of the Cold War, that anyone who had any doubts that this war was worth fighting and um, worth the risk of a nuclear exchange was accused of being a dupe or a, or a secret sympathizer or, um, or a, a, a fan of Neville Chamberlain's umbrella or all these other things. It was a, people were constantly being crushed and coerced and derided and sort of driven out of the argument. And I, I wanted to put that down before people forget it. Um, All these people were ostensibly there, meaning a conference of conservatives, neoconservatives, to take personal credit for the final collapse of communism. Why then do they look and sound so lost and deflated like a herd of ants in search of a climax? No, it's a herd of anties in search of a climax. Excuse me, my eyes are bad. Well, no, maybe there's a misprint. <laughs> no, no, you're right. It's supposed to be a, a, a herd of anties in search of a climax. Well, I was, I was convinced that partly because they'd lost their willingness, uh, excuse me, not their willingness, they'd lost their ability to be able to bully and blackmail the opposition and accuse it of treachery and sympathy for the other side, that uh, that was one of the reasons that the right wing is nostalgic for the Cold War, that it's lost its free pass as being the patriots where everyone else is disloyal. It's not the whole thing. I mean, they've also lost a lot of their subsidies, which I think makes them squeal even louder. These people used to have very fat foundations supporting any project of theirs, however mediocre or, or crackpotted. Now they don't have that anymore. And we're also beginning to count the cost of the Cold War to the United States, which is... Um, which is pretty enormous, to say nothing of the damage that it did to other countries around the world. Did you go to that conference? Yeah, sure. I sat through every minute of it. How do they treat you? They know you're there to probably write something. They, would, uh, not... they wouldn't let me. They had a queue of people for the microphones to ask questions and join the line. It was noticed even by some conservative uh, people there present who, who actually had the decency to protest about it. But as soon as it came to my turn to get to the microphone, Norman Podhoritz, who was the chairman of the thing, cut off the discussion at that point. I mean, it was so blatant as to be um, laughable. But I was flattered by it. Who's your favorite conservative writer in the United States? William Safar. I'm a very great admirer of his. I think, he's a, I think he's a wonderful writer. I think he's a very humorous writer. I think he's quite a brave writer, too. He tries to remember that even though, you know, his own... when his own team are in power, that, you, that doesn't mean you're obliged to stop criticizing. Who's your favorite liberal writer? I don't think liberals make very good writers. Um, I think liberals are always trying to have it both ways. They both want to be, um, they want to share in the idea that capitalism is basically the best humanity can do, um, but they want to be able to be compassionate about it. I mean, I think that leads to a rather sickly kind of writing, the sort you get from Anthony Lewis, for example. I find it very hard to read, and I find I think it is harder to read than it is to write. I think of the radical writers, though, the, there are some outstanding cases. There's, well, I mentioned Gore Vidal already, who I think is one of the best writers of this or any other time and who is the person I, I've most, I guess, tried to model myself on in that he's so much of a polymath and he has such a range and is, tries to synthesize literature and politics very brilliantly. So I uh, openly confess to, to a sort of um, 
be wrong to say penis envy for Gore Vidal, wouldn't it? But you know what I mean. And then there's Alex Alexander Coburn, my colleague at The Nation, who's an extra master writer of polemic, and, and um, there's currently operating in print. Well, you see, the problem is that, I mean, if I was to mention many other names, they would be names that never see, never see the mass media, because, in effect, the, the left doesn't exist as a, as a regular contributor to the ongoing national discussion on TV and radio and, and the print. The Nation, June 1991. What the hell did General Norman Schwarzkopf think he was doing when he accepted, while he was still a senior serving officer, a knighthood from Queen Elizabeth II? Yes. Question I could never get him or anyone at the Pentagon to answer. The Constitution of the United States, which I am, well, consecrated to admiring, um, because I come from a country that doesn't have a constitution, and so I, I think I appreciate it maybe more than people are taking it for granted. Very clearly says that um, American uh, serving officials shall not take decorations or titles of honor from any foreign uh, monarch or head of state. And there was Schwarzkopf being knighted by Queen Elizabeth. I thought, what is this? We're supposed to have a republic here and a republic of laws at that. And I can't stand it when people think that the highest honor that can uh, come to them is to be allowed to sprawl at the feet of the House of Windsor, which is uh, a dysfunctional royal family that is now pretty much discredited even in England. February 1991, The Nation again, Bush and Churchillian delusions. Mm. According to the 11 February issue of The New Republic, the scene that follows occurred one day after the proud inauguration of Operation Desert Storm. It starts off that Jack Kemp, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, b brought a copy of Winston and Clementine, a book about the Churchills, to the Cabinet meeting on, on January the 17th, intending to give it to President Bush. And you go on to say there's more. What was your point? That Bush, um, throughout that whole war, uh, and especially the, in the run-up to it, constantly compared himself to Churchill and compared the, the confrontation that he was faced with to the one that Churchill had had to endure in 1939, borrowed from the speeches used phrases like the defining hour and so on, which are knockoffs of Churchill's speeches in 1939-1940, wanted the comparison to be made. In the Senate debate for and against the war, the Churchill-Munich analogy was used more often even than Vietnam uh, as a, a test of you know, which side you were on. And I again wondered why it is that in the United States people are, are such pushovers for this, uh, this English mythology. And I also said, there was no way that, however it was sliced, that Bush could come off as Churchill. After all, as we now know, um, the, the war with, and as a lot of us guessed at the time, the war with Saddam Hussein was a quarrel that had broken out between two business partners, Bush and Hussein, who were fighting over the spoils. They wanted to involve everyone else in it, and they wanted for it to sound noble. And they fooled a lot of people for some of the time. But as, as you know, the disillusionment with that war and the rhetoric with which it was fought is now pretty near total. You spent some time in jail. Didn't you spend some time in jail in Prague? In jail in Prague, yes, I did. I thought, I thought this, <laughs> for me, I thought this, this was the, to be the consequence of my uh, saying um, what I said about the, the great patriotic war in the desert. Yeah, I did. I got locked up in Czechoslovakia in 1988, I think it was. I went with a delegation of people there to meet the Czech opposition, and we got caught um, trying to hold a seminar. And we were locked up and then deported. What was that like? And I wrote a piece then saying that I thought it was obvious that um, that the Czech and Polish and East German and Bulgarian regimes, the Russian Empire and Eastern Europe, was going to collapse because it was. It seemed to me absolutely clear that the regime had no further support at all. It was simply living on police tactics. What was it like being in jail? In my case, it was exhilarating because of the people I was locked up with, who were wonderful. Um, a very nice selection of various Western human rights activists and some incredibly brave Czechs who, um, of course, were taking much more of a risk than we were because we knew probably we were just going to get taken to the airport and, and thrown out. And they might have to stay for rather longer, but what impressed me about them was that many of them had not even been born at the time of the Soviet invasion in 1968, so that um, they had no memory, as it were, of the pre-existing regime. They'd been brought up under the the Russian dispensation, and they, they'd seen through it completely and were prepared to take risks to defy it. I thought, well, that, that spells the end for them. When you're I think I was right about that, actually. When you're deciding um, where to go and, and what to write, what kind of, I mean, is there travel money for you to go anywhere? Will the nation send you anywhere? 
No, not in, usually the best way to do it is to just do it and then see if you can't sell the articles when you come back. That's what I had to do with Bosnia, for example. I thought I really must go and see what's happening in Sarajevo. I can't not go. When did you go? Last time I. And How long did you go there for? I'm in Sarajevo two and a half to three days and nights, which is not long, but it's plenty, I can tell you. Unless you are, as some good reporters are, you know, able to put up with a lot by way of being sort of bombarded and shot at and kept permanently scared. I mean, I, felt, I thought I'd got the point about being permanently scared after a few days. And it's also quite a small city, and I was able to see a lot of it in the remainder of the country of, of Bosnia and um, surrounding bits of, of, of Croatia and Slovenia rather longer, um, but, but not, not at such high risk. And I thought, really, I have to go. The problem was I had no particular credential to represent anybody, but I just thought it was a sort of responsibility to go and see what it looked like. And I've been very... I think I've bored you with this in the past. I've become very obsessed with it since. And then I just wrote a number of pieces and sort of made back the money of the ticket that way. Do you travel as a British citizen or an American citizen? British passport. You intend to... Well, rather, I mean, what I'd rather say is, and the reason I kept the British passport is a European passport, because as of 1992, there is now a Euro passport that makes you free to travel within the boundaries of 12 member countries. And I've always liked the idea of European unity. And so I held out for a Euro passport. So I travel as a European. Will you ever change your citizenship? Well, I, you, you ask me, I mean, if I said to you I'm an American, you'd say, but that's not true, you're really an Englishman. And I think that, I think I would always probably sound and seem to be English. So it would seem odd to me to say I was an American in England, or say I was an American here, so I've, I have a green card. Resident alien, as they say. And, um, and a uh, European passport, and I sort of think that's a, a form of being an internationalist. Going back to where sound too pretentious. Going back to where we started on uh, your your piece uh, section of this book called Rogues Gallery. By the way, there are a lot of things we have not talked about in this book, uh, and they have to do with your opinion of things other than American. Yes. Um, how did you mix that? I mean, is this book being sold in both countries? Sure. Is it being sold? Is it being translated in the other any other language? We haven't had any offers that I know about. But usually, every book gets translated into Japanese these days. They're tremendously omnivorous in, in getting in getting to read everything, and I, I'd love to see myself in Japanese. Uh, uh, how did you decide this this particular uh, item is out of a, a, a thing called Descent, Fall of 1990? What's Descent? Descent is the magazine that's associated with the late Irving Howe, who you may have read about. I say the late because he died, I think, the month before last. We're now in, what, the 1st of September today. Irving Howe was a great old self-made writer, scholar, essayist, socialist critic, best known for a book called World of Our Fathers, which is a wonderful account of the origins of um, Jewish life in New York from the first immigration to the Lower East Side and then the burgeoning out to become... I guess the most successful of America's minorities. Um, and he discovered um, the writing in Yiddish of Isaac Singer, Isaac Bashevis Singer, who later won the Nobel Prize, who was scribbling away unknown in, in Yiddish only kind of small magazines in New York. And he discovered him and had him translated and made him world famous. And he also founded a magazine called Descent, which is published four times a year, I believe, and I write for occasionally. This is a piece called Nixon, uh, Maestro of Resentment. Mm. And you lead off this thing by, by saying, but as I read this, the latest of his awful books, uh, over the years, has Richard Nixon been someone that you've uh, found easy to write about? Yeah, and also difficult, because as I say in that piece, there's always the temptation to feel sorry for him. Um, I mean, I fight it down, this temptation. I, I try not to give in to any promptings of compassion or, or pity. Well, let me read just But there is something sad and lonely and desperate uh, and artificial about the guy, and... And it does occasionally give you a pang. And I, uh, that piece is about, about trying to um, fight off the, the pang. Well, you wrote this, this um, sentence. You said, the interesting bits of Nixon's private existence, the foul mouth, the Jew-hating, the paranoia, yeah. all lie under a ban of denial and are bled out of the narrative. Yes. I mean, the Nixon of the tapes, where he makes, as you know, terrible remarks about how the Jews are behind his persecution, uh, the Jews are behind the anti-war movement, the Jews are behind the arts life in America. He tells his children to stay away from the Jews. And even uses uh, foul words like kike, yid, and so on. Um, those are on the tapes, and you can actually go and hear them as well as read them, if you, if you care to, or if you can stand it. 
in his book, he just, it's not that he says, look, I was overwrought at the time and I meant, you know, I shouldn't have generalized or something. He just doesn't discuss it at all. It's different guy writing than the person who's on the tapes. This is a, it's, would be dignifying that to call it schizophrenia. I think it's simply dishonest. You started all this by saying it's good for you to get up in the morning angry mm -hmm. if you're a writer. What are you angry about now? Oh, by the way, that reminds me of someone I criminally left out when you asked who I thought was the, was the great uh, radical writer at the moment. I left out uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, who I mean, I think is uh, one of the most extraordinary moral human beings of our time and who's produced a, a shelf of books and critiques and findings and carefully calibrated work that holds up a mirror to American policy and society that, that it should look in more often. The reason I'm reminded of it is that um, there's a wonderful story about Noam. He went to the dentist one day. It's true. And the dentist said, you're grinding your teeth. And he said, no, I'm not as far as I know. And he said, oh, a lot of my patients say that. You're probably grinding them when you're asleep. And his wife sort of monitored him around the clock and he wasn't doing it. Went asleep and they monitored him more closely and they found he was only grinding his teeth in the morning when he was reading the New York Times. <laughs> and I, I think, A, that's a great story about Chomsky, all of whose stuff anyone watching this should rush out and buy. And who's an example to us all. But also because I have the same experience reading the mainstream take on daily life every day and the way that the editorials refer to we as if we were all one big family and it was all up to us. And one thing society is not is a family, not even a dysfunctional one. Uh, the way it's always assumed that the consensus comes first and the, the bright little ways in which they sort of package the news and make it digestible for us always starts me off feeling thoroughly pissed off every day. What, uh, how about an individual that makes you the angriest these days? Janet Reno is particularly annoying me at the moment, I think. Again, not, not, so, not just because I don't think she's anything like as good as people say, but because people keep saying how great she is and you ask them, why is that? And then they don't, they can't really tell you. And I'm completely furious with her for burying the Iraq Gate scandal, for taking the, the Bush quail line, that, that there was no, nothing sinister about the bank in Atlanta that was arming Saddam for, uh, for, for the, the later war between business partners that we all had to go through. How much longer are you going to do this? Till I drop. In this country? If they'll have me. This is what the cover of this book looks like. It's a compendium of articles in various publications, including Harper's and The Nation and others. Christopher Hitchens, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Brian.